ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Charleston Festival. Um, for those of you who have not been before or who don't remember, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Virginia Nicholson, and I'm Deputy Chairman of the Charleston Trust. I'm also granddaughter of Vanessa Bell, the Bloomsbury artist who once lived in the house at the top of the garden there. Um, now, I'm guessing here, but I think that Kate Summerscale's latest book, Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace, would have been a Bloomsbury favourite. It's got so many of the ingredients that would have appealed to people like my father, to his aunt Virginia Woolf, to Lytton Strachey and all that lot. As radical writers and artists who were trying to escape the clutches of the 19th century, they loved to ridicule the Victorians. But of course, they were also half in love with the extraordinary age that had produced their own literary precursors like Thackeray, Wilkie Collins and Leslie Stephen. Modernists they may have been, but you only have to look at their own lives to see that they also had an appetite for high drama, melodrama, scandal and illicit passions. Like Mrs. Robinson, they questioned marriage, religion and moral orthodoxies. Now personally, and speaking as a social historian, I've absolutely loved reading Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace every bit as much as I loved reading The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher. In both cases, Kate Summerscale's skill as a documentarist, a storyteller, and an historical interpolator is enviable. She has the tenacity of a first-class researcher, combined with an unerring ability to enter the Victorian mindset. Unsurprisingly, Mr. Witcher won the Samuel Johnson Prize for Nonfiction in 2008. If the reviews for this one are anything to go by, Mrs. Robinson is set for similar glory. Here on the platform to talk to her today is another exceptional social historian, Judith Flanders. Judith visited the Charleston Festival, we think about 10 years ago, but we're not quite sure, to talk to us about her book, A Circle of Sisters. Since then, she's also written wonderful books about the Victorian house, consuming passions, leisure and pleasure in Victorian Britain, and the invention of murder, how the Victorians reveled in death and detection and invented modern crime. So congratulations as ever to Diana Reich for clever programming. As you can see, I think these two are going to have a lot to talk about. And the format today is going to be that Kate is going to come up to the lectern here and do a brief reading from Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace. Then Kate and Judith are going to have a discussion about the book and about their common interests. And then we'll follow that with um, a question and answer session with the audience. So now I'm going to get off the platform and leave them to it and we can all revel in it together. Hello. Um, I'm going to read from the first chapter of Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace, a little way in, and I should explain the setup beforehand. Um, my book's about a woman's diary that was used in a divorce case, one of the first divorce cases after the Divorce Act of 1858. It was used against her as evidence of her adultery by her husband, but she also quoted from it herself as evidence of the fact that she was sexually insane and had hallucinated the erotic scenes that she described. Um, the diary began, she began her diary in 1849, but the important episodes date from 1850 when she and her husband moved to Edinburgh and she fell in love with a man 10 years her junior, a married man called Edward Lane and became obsessed by him over the years. Eventually, her longing for Mr. Lane was apparently consummated. The diary describes scenes in which they cavorted in the grounds of a waterkill spa in Surrey. But the passage I'm going to read from is, um, dates from much earlier in the relationship when Isabella was falling for him but felt that her feelings were unrequited and still kept hoping that he might reciprocate. So this is in 1852, Isabella's living in Edinburgh 
with her three sons, one by a previous marriage to a man who died, and two by her horrible husband, Henry. And um, the extracts I'm going to read are drawn from the diary entries that were quoted in court and which I have filled out with my own research. In the grey afternoon of Sunday, 14th of March, 1852, Isabella took a turn through the Edinburgh New Town on foot. The three-year-old Stanley probably stayed at home with the nursemaid, an Irish woman called Eliza Power, but Otway and Alfred, aged seven and eleven, accompanied their mother. The group climbed the hill from Morrie Place and carried on over the summit and down to Prince's Street, a wide avenue on the southern edge of the new town. A terrace of houses ran along one side of the street. The facing pavement was reined in only by an iron railing, beyond which lay a steep drop and a far view over the dip of the ravine to the blackened tenements of the old town on the hill beyond. The city, dimly visible, lay before us, wrote Isabella in her diary. Spires, monuments, streets, the port of Leith, the Frith, and in the front ground, small unventilated dwellings and houses of ten stories high. Isabella was gazing across a gulf from rich to poor, from the sparse, clear streets of modern Edinburgh to the busy vertical slums of the old. The area between the new and old towns had been drained and levelled at the beginning of the century, and in 1842 a railway line had been laid into the gorge. Though a few shops had set up along Prince's Street, there was a lonely luxury to the thoroughfares along which Isabella walked with her sons. On a Sunday, the area was desolate. The shops were shut up and the blinds of the houses drawn. Isabella wished that she could enter the secret warren across the tracks. Oh, thought I, each of these roofs conceals human life with all its mysterious joys and sorrows. Doubtless, many a sojourner in these dwellings has a private history, thrilling, exciting, strange. If I knew them, some of them might make me feel less sad, less lonely. There might be hearts as much discontented with their lots as mine. Few, I think, more weary of life. I walked home with my boys, she continued. At heart, I love and value them, and were it not that my darling Otway would be taken from me, I would leave my husband forever. If she and Henry were to part, she would retain custody of Alfred, the child of her first husband, and perhaps of Stanley, the Custody of Infants Act of 1839, for the first time allowed a separated woman to petition for custody of any of her children who were under seven, as long as she was of good character. Otway, though, would be certain to remain with his father. Isabella reached her house at half past five and tried to calm her troubled spirits. Played psalms, wrote journal, read, smoked cigar, boys with me till nine, felt rather less sad. To read, to play the piano and to spend time with children were conventional pastimes for a middle-class Victorian woman. To smoke a cigar, though, was a distinctly rebellious, unfeminine act. On Saturday, 27th of March, 1852, Isabella organised an outing for herself and her children. She invited Edward Lane to accompany them and hired a carriage and driver to pick up both families after lunch. Henry was away. The morning was cold and bright. Resolve to get ready early for the drive, Isabella wrote, to which I could not help looking forward with pleasure, not unmixed with a dread that something seemed to mar the pleasure I had promised myself, as it nearly always does with me. The day started badly. She got up late, which meant that she missed an appointment, and a glass of sherry before lunch gave her a confused headache. She became annoyed by her son's rude behaviour in the garden. I dined in haste, she told her diary, and left home immediately, not to lose the fairness of the day. On reaching Eight Royal Circus, the Lane's home, Isabella discovered that her dread had been justified. After some delay and confusion, I found Mrs. Lane was to go too, and I knew well that all hope of a pleasant tete-a-tete -tete was over for that day. I could hardly bid her, bid her and Attie welcome, or affect good humour, much less gaiety. Isabella had become used to having Edward to herself. The two families set out by carriage, with the three boys outside on the box and the three adults inside. They headed north towards the sea and then west along the coast, passing the new harbour at Granton. Inside the carriage, the talk was formal and confused. Mr. L read scraps from Coleridge and Tennyson, 
Five miles on, the carriage drew up near a line of whitewashed cottages in the seaside village of Cramond at the mouth of the River Armand, where the party scaled a steep path to a sheltered sunny corner on the bank. There they laid out their books and their plaids. To the north lay the rocky grassland of Cramond Island, to which day-trippers could walk at low tide across the sandy flats. Mary Lane took the boys off to gather gorse, leaving Isabella and Edward alone. But no real cheerfulness came to my heart, said Isabella. She and Edward talked of life, of carna, of property, of riches and of birth, of dejection, education, poverty, etc., and read out a few disjointed passages from our poets, including, Isabella remembered, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Dejection, an ode. We rose to go when the sun got low, wrote Isabella, got into the carriage and kept up a conversation wholly without interest on my part, duly admiring the views, which were fine. Back in the city, the carriage dropped the lanes at Eight Royal Circus, where Isabella's boys climbed off the box and got inside. They arrived back at Murray Place at half past six with Isabella feeling as much vexed, dispirited, chagrined and cast down as I ever remember to have been. Isabella remonstrated with herself for leaving a bad impression on the lanes. Mrs. Lane looked several times cold and puzzled, she wrote. He was constrained, the child was tired, no one was obliged or pleased. She usually presented a composed front to her friends and unburdened herself to her diary, but on this day her dissatisfaction had been all too visible. I had spent eight shillings for worse than nothing, she wrote, caught between self-pity and self-disgust. Good God, why is it everything I plan or wish for is turned to such bitterness? Surely it must be my own fault. I long for things I ought not to prize. I find it impossible to love where I ought or to keep from loving where I ought not. My mind is a chaos, she confessed, a confused mingling of good and evil. I weary of my very self, yet cannot die. Um, sorry, little friend. <laughs> Um, I thought maybe what we should start with before we go much further is just to have a little overview of the setup. I mean, you gave us a little bit of setup. Um, do you want to sort of take the story a bit further and just explain a little bit more about what happened so that yes, we can then... Sure. Um, well, Isabella, as I, I hope the bit I read gives a sense of her voice in the diary, the sort of mixture of self-absorbed, self-pity, but also quite rigorous self-criticism, and uh, no, she's hard on herself too. She began her diary um, w in this very unhappy condition, as described there. She had been married to her husband, Henry, for six years, but she had come to despise him. He was a successful entrepreneurial industrialist. He was often away from home. Um, he had no interest in the poetry and scientific and philosophical <coughs> ideas that Isabella wanted to explore and discuss. And so when she came across Edward Lane and his circle, who were a really um, pioneering kind of explorative group of thinkers in Edinburgh, um, particularly in the areas of the sciences, she was thrilled and excited both intellectually and romantically and sexually by Edward Lane and everything that he um, represented. Um, when she moved south two years later, um, Henry insisted they move down to Berkshire so he could be nearer his work in London and she was devastated because she was separated from this circle um, and she also by now had discovered that her husband had a mistress and two illegitimate children and she had become convinced that he had married her for her money. He had steadily tried to take control of her checkbook. She had private funds that had been settled on her by her father. She came from a um, rather rich and um, was well-born, she was a well-born woman um, of a superior social class to Henry.
um, of a superior social class to Henry, as well as having more inheritance. Um, so in, in England, she got um, all the more depressed. She lost her faith in God. She yearned for Edward Lane. She fell in love with or became infatuated with other young men who crossed her path, fixing on whatever was available. And um, to her delight, in 1854, Edward Lane moved, moved south so that his, he set up a water cure spa in Surrey, which was very close to her home. And she visited him there. And according to the diary, it was there that they consummated their affair. And um, two years later, Henry discovered the diary while, Elizabeth, while Isabella was in a delirious fever in the, her bedroom on a trip to Boulogne. And he read it and discovered how much his wife loathed him, if he didn't already know. Knew, <coughs> know. And he also discovered about all her infatuations with other men and the fact that she had apparently had an affair with Edward Lane, his family friend. So he took the diary... Um, confiscated it. It was his property in any case, so uh, since uh, her chattels are his. Um, and the two sons of their marriage uh, took them back to England and um, sued for divorce as soon as the new divorce court opened in 1858, which was a court that for the first time made divorce affordable for the middle classes. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, her diary belonged to him. Her money didn't quite belong to him in law, but it almost did by custom. Mm. Um, one of the things that I found so interesting about this, how is it was a sort of little optic, it, it was an encapsulation of the position of women in society. Um, I mean, very prosperous women for mm. the most part. Um, but it showed just how powerless they were. Mm. Yes, yeah, so in fact, Isabella, by rights, should have been one of the less dependent women of Victorian England because she had this settlement that her <coughs> father had made, which, to be, tr to be frank, wasn't really designed to benefit her, but her sons. It was to protect the male line from, say, a profligate husband. Um, so she, she did have potentially financial independence, but in a contradictory and completely familiar way, she nonetheless conformed to the customs of her time in giving her husband complete power over this money. She, he asked her soon after their marriage if she would sign every cheque in her cheque book. She had an account in London and um, give it to him, and she simply did so. So it was in name only that, that the money that her father, that was coming in, the interest on the money settled on her was hers. And in practice, it was Henry's. As is indeed, as you mentioned briefly in the reading, were the children. Yes, and this, um, I realised that although if she and Henry were to separate, if she were, had been to leave him, she would have retained some control over her money. Um, she would have lost her children, certainly her middle child, Otway, who was her favourite, she said in the diary. And um, that was really what locked her into the marriage completely because there was, it was nothing to do with fault. Even if she left her husband because he um, w had a mistress, uh, the children would still be his. They belonged to him. And um, so that was the real, the real trap, was the children, and which is not so different from the reasons why many marriages might stay together even now, and I, I do find that interesting. And you know, money and children—it's the same, <laughs> same stuff in different yeah. configurations. And 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 equally, that that what, what I thought was so interesting was precisely that um, idea that, as you say, the money had carefully been protected from the husband, um, but the idea of how women behaved or should behave. Mm. But made it unprotectable in a way. Yeah, but this is what um, one of the things that makes Il Isabella Robinson so fascinating to me that she did conform in exactly that way to the customs of the time and the normal behaviour, and she worried, worried about being a good wife and mother. Um, 
and she castigated herself for her failings in that respect. But at the same time, the diary shows her absolutely furious at the ways in which she was constrained and the double standards that were applied to men and women. And the, she was angry about Henry taking her money. He tried to appropriate money settled on her eldest son by his father who had died. And she was, she was furious about this. So in one way she had a moral code that, that loosely conformed to that of the society in which she found herself. But she also was kind of developing this different code of behavior in which adultery was not so bad if you had a really mean husband. <laughs> and um, that to be a good mother didn't mean you had to be a faithful wife. Uh, where you didn't have to believe in God, where you could really feel that there was something wrong about your husband taking what was meant to be yours. And so she, she was a rebel and a conformist well, at once, but she did dare think some things that probably surprised we all are. me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. you know, one of the things that, that makes it so interesting is just change the details and we're all like that. Mm, I that recognized her very much the confusion about wh where to uh, where to conform and where to rebel and yeah. where to get your bearings in a, in a situation that's gone terribly wrong. Uh, wh one of the things that occurred to me when I was reading it is um, first of all how did you come across this diary? That, that well the diary itself I have or, uh, yeah but the story yeah. The diary itself I have as yet <laughs> not come across and I presume it's dis been destroyed because um, when Henry took it from Isabella in Boulogne in 1856 he, he never returned it and I have no doubt that he would have wished it burnt after the, the trial and before his death because it was a document that was extremely degrading to him. Um, but the story I came across um, when I was researching my last book, Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, and um, it was in a, I, it was, there was a reference in a book about Victorian crime and sensation fiction, popular fiction, um, and it sounded so fascinating. It was a story, there was the trial that was described briefly, and the way in which the woman was defending herself by saying she was suffering from erotomania and had sexual delusions, and um, that everyone seemed to take this very seriously, and lots of medical experts were brought in. Um, and the diary itself, her voice, um, seemed to me so um, modern and vivid. Um, and then I, I sort of kept going back to it, wondering if there might be a whole <laughs> book in this little mm -hmm. story. And then I started to search for more material, to see what I could find in the National Archives, in the contemporary newspaper reports, and then beyond that. So I did find other sources which I couldn't have anticipated finding and without which I couldn't really have written the book. But it, the, the diary itself is so interesting because I think probably terribly unusually it was evidence for both sides mm. in that Henry presented it as evidence of adultery and she used it in effect to say look, writing about your adultery is insane. Therefore, I must have been insane. Mm. <laughs> and I'm not guilty because I was mad. Mm. And I'm not sure I've ever heard of a case where, in effect, what, what, what this does is it sort of sets up, I I if you like, the prototypical biographer or historian's dilemma, which is that every piece of evidence mm. can turn both ways. Yes, yes, I exactly. I did, um, and I think that's part of what drew it to me. It is uh, the, the diary in itself it's, and the uses to which it was put does encapsulate the difficulties that um, uh, anyone researching and writing about history encounters every time. How do you trust this source? How do you know if it's true? <laughs> um, what's the, how do you evaluate and balance competing stories about the same thing or how do you account for missing stories and missing evidence when you're telling the story and um, yes yeah, is, is, is how reliable um, are, are written documents 
and how do we... One of the ways in which you can measure it, a document is sort of who it's written for and under which conditions. And a diary is the slipperiest of all because it, the, I, who the reader is is incredibly unclear. Is the reader the writer's future self, their children, an idealised, best, perfect friend who they've not yet met, um, their lover or their wished-for lover? Um, it's a very... And without knowing who it's written for, it's very hard to know what it says. Mm. And that's what the court found. The, the court, in this case, was so confounded and baffled, the judges, that they kept postponing it. They changed the law in order to allow Edward Lane to testify in his own defence, which had previously been impossible. Um, and I was fascinated by the simultaneous kind of flakiness and incredible power of this diary. Mm. No one could decide on, on what, it, what it meant. And to me, it seemed to that was a way, and it wasn't just what it meant about Isabella and her relationship with Edward Lane and her marriage to her husband, but also what it meant about what were women really sort of thinking and doing. Were they fantasizing or were they acting out their fantasies, put very simply? And I think, I think we, we, perhaps many of us have had that experience of finding the um, three pages of a diary you kept when you were 17 before you gave up in despair or boredom. And you think, what was I thinking? Oh, my God. Uh, you know, and you're just glad you found it and you can burn it. <laughs> um, but the, the thing about, that I found about the diary, I mean, I, I must tell you, I took against her. Um, I really disliked her. <laughs> Um, I know you disliked her husband. I really disliked her. And I thought that was what was so interesting, is I thought, here is an enormously sympathetic reader who has come up with an re reading exactly what I'm reading, who's come up with the precise opposite of what I think. I mean, I wanted to personally try her for crimes against literature, but um, <laughs> I mean, it was very purple in places. It really was shall we say, uh, rather overwritten. Um, and so, in a way, what I was doing is I was sort of, I, I realized I was taking Henry's side, um, simply because I disliked her. <laughs> and so, I spent a lot of time thinking, hmm, well, where did she find that information then? Why should I believe her? And... What was very interesting, um, when, when, when Kate and I spoke earlier, I said to her, well, we have no proof that that mistress and the children existed. Um, because they, uh, what, what, what Kate had written is she, she wrote about them in the diary, and then Kate says that they were actually, no, that the, the, the existence of them was never actually brought up in court because um, the 1858 law said that for a man to get divorced, all he had to do was prove adultery. Um, for a woman to divorce, she had to prove adultery and another thing like cruelty. Um, so he didn't need to prove, you know, prove anything else. It was just the adultery for him. And I thought, well, maybe they were, you know, she's claiming she's mad. Maybe they were figments of her imagination. And, I mean, you, you've told me they're not. Yeah, I'd, yes, it's, um, I, I know they're not because of the way in which they're referred to by Isabella. It's been quite um, sort of practical offhand ways, like saying Henry's got his illegitimate daughter with him at Reading at the moment and he's trying to introduce her to society. That doesn't sound like you know, the, the um, work of a fantasist. And um, she says it as if it's something everyone knows. She mm. refers to it in letters to people who know them. And so I think, and they don't contradict her, and a friend also makes reference to the fact that Henry was not a faithful husband. So I think that um, the evidence there is, is credible. Mm. Um, the question of whether I have to, wh whether it would have been sensible to explain why I believed her on that, um, because th there, are reader, th there are readers who might doubt it. You it's don't know really if you're going to get stroppy readers <laughs> like me, yes. <laughs> It's very interesting, and you have to make decisions all the time about how much to sort of give the source, and then how much you, don't, you need to not only give the source, but say why you think that source is reliable, with reference to other sources. Well, it could be an endless process. Oh, you can see it's rather it's like the diary, isn't it? Who are you writing for? Yes. <laughs>
true. Um, and I find it really um, exciting, rather wonderful, that somebody can read the book. I mean, what I try to do is what I think the most, the best thing about writing non-fiction and about non-fiction and history in a way is the fact that it remains mysterious and unattainable. It's what draws me to it in the first place and although of course I've got an impulse to solve the mystery, find out what really happened, did they or didn't they, what was she like, you know, um, a part of me also wants to preserve and well has no choice but to allow that there are things we'll never know and that the answers will never be conclusive. And so, so what I hope to do in the book is um, to leave that openness while at the same time making pretty clear what I think happened. I, you know, I know the story well. I've been working on it for three years. I have views. <laughs> I have hunches. So we that is in there, but I hope it's not in there to the extent that it closes down other possible readings. Well, it, it's you're, you're sort of doing, a, a, as a historian or a biographer, you're sort of doing what the court is doing, aren't you? You're winnowing out witnesses, you're deciding who is reliable, mm. and you are presenting a case mm. to the court, which is, in your case, the reader. Yes. Um, and but I'm giving, I want to have all the evidence still there so that somebody could read against my huh. reading and, um, and reach a different conclusion because that seems to me to be what gives a book life, that you can, a, a book about history, that it can be, so that's, I, I like that you can dislike her, and, um, and I, people, yes, I, I mean, my view, um, put very broadly, is that she is, in the end, pretty credible. Her diary is pretty mm. credible, albeit ornamented and wishful and subjective. Um, but I, I do know people who read the book and, and think, no, she is mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did, I did have to seriously entertain that possibility because part of me had to sort of make sure I wasn't imposing on this story um, the, my 21st century assumptions. Mm -hmm. And since the idea that she was sexually insane was taken so seriously in the press and in the court at the time, I, I have to be very careful not to dismiss that out of hand because it's not my, uh, you know, a contemporary way of thinking. Um, and they really did. The thing you mentioned earlier, that, that it, the press kept repeating, which was her argument, her defense, that the very fact of writing a diary were about such disgusting things was in itself evidence of insanity. So in a way, the writing of the diary was the more serious crime and the evidence of, of madness. It was the thing that was really transgressive to such an extent that it seemed irrational. Well, I, I also felt that precisely because of this thing of a n nice, inverted commas, upper middle class woman um, from a good family with ostensibly a decent husband actually writing about physical desire Mm. That in itself seemed to be what was that, yeah. wh what was so disturbing to so many men. Yes, because of course what uh, what, what I was also interested in we, we was we're in the same decade as um, the origin of species, mm -hmm. and what people really objected to about Darwin's ideas was that if sexual selection says, you know, peacocks have tails because it makes them more beautiful so that women will choose them, was the act of women choosing. Because the Victorian idea was that women sit there very passively and mm. men choose them. Mm. And they were very disturbed by this idea, even when you're talking about peacocks. <laughs> um, and so what, what I thought was so interesting about this was this was Mm. Precisely that written out in the divorce court, yes. that it was her making choices, yeah, and she and uh, indeed acting on them. And in fact, Darwin was a patient at Dr. Lane's water cure spa and was very much of the same mind, the same circle. And Isabella, first when she was in Edinburgh, she met George Coombe, a pioneer of phrenology, who felt the bumps on her head and told her that she had a very large organ of amativeness. <laughs> and <laughs> however cranky these ideas may seem now, at the time they were part of a really um, 
quite revolutionary way of thinking about feelings as being located and um, impulses in the body. Being biological being impulses. biological. And so these um, ideas gave her a way of thinking about herself and her sexual drive. Um, and trying, in writing the diary, she was trying to document and control her baser instincts. But um, in, she had a kind of scientific, proto-scientific understanding of what was going on in her head that was part of the same culture um, that gave rise to Darwinian thought. And um, so the diary was, uh, was, was an example of something kind of uh, d dangerously subversive in, in that sense too. And in fact, when it came to the, the build-up to the trial, some of Edward Lane's friends, George Coombe, the famous phrenologist among them, got in a real panic about their connection to Isabella being exposed in court, in public, because they were written about in the diary too. And um, they felt that not only there, it would it be personally embarrassing for them to be connected to this sex-crazed woman, but that um, it would be uh, damaging to the whole sort of set of ideas that they were promoting because it would suggest that these progressive scientific ideas really did have a direct link to immorality, godlessness and debauchery. Um, so they needed to, to protect the integrity of their, their ideas by dissociating themselves from her and successfully as it turned out because I didn't know of her connection to George Coombe or any of these thinkers in Edinburgh uh, through the trial, the record reports of the trial, none of that came out. Um, it was only by finding an archive of letters in Edinburgh that, uh, that I discovered that link. And so there was a very successful sort of hushing up of everyone who, to whom she was connected and the kind of intellectual culture that had uh, fed into her diary and her behaviour. I, I think it's probably, we, we should I should have mentioned earlier, it, it is important to say that um, Kate tells us that this was the 11th divorce case to be heard. So the interest in it, I mean, however mm. much the Victorian, later Victorians, as we know, loved reading about divorce, um, to have been in that first batch mm. must have been extraordinary in terms of publicity. Yeah, and every uh, the, these early cases, they were really exciting for newspaper readers and uh, to, to read about uh, because they're nothing these middle-class marriages and all their dark secrets and so on, but they were not just excited, they felt um, representative of something mm -hmm. because they were the first. It seemed symbolic, and the way in which they were discussed in the press reflected that, um, and Queen Victoria was worried about the stories coming out of the divorce court and being reported in the press because she thought they, would, that they were corrupting they were a sort of manual for misbehavior in <laughs> marriage. So, 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 so if Henry can have two mistresses and his w wife yes. can have an affair, I will too. Yeah. And I think that the diary, however unsympathetic you found <laughs> Isabella, I suspect that part of the danger that was perceived in the diary was not just that it was exciting in a sexual way, although that was said, the observer refused to print the diary extracts for that reason, but also because she might provoke sympathy, that hmm. she might, there might be kindred spirits out there who would read the newspaper and feel for her and not just condemn her. And, um, well, and women in particular which who might feel that way. Which takes us, of course, to the literary parallel you, you discuss, which is Madame Bovary. Hmm. Which, um, Madame Bovary, I, it, I, when I was researching the story, I, I kept kept being reminded of it. In particular, there's a scene in which um, uh, Isabella and Edward uh, canoodle, I'm <laughs> not sure exactly what happens, but in a, in a closed carriage on the way to a railway station. And it's very sort of suggestive and steamy the way she writes about it, um, though not explicit. And it reminded me of the scene in Madame Bovary where Emma Bovary uh, had sex in a carriage in Rouen. Um, so I looked, I thought, well, well, which is first? It's sort of about the same time I knew. So I checked, and I discovered that um, Flaubert was writing Madame Bovary in the exact five years that Isabella Robinson was writing her diary. So there was no cause and effect. It's not as if one read the other, but there is a synchronicity, and, um, and, and it's 
well, obviously one's factual, or is it, <laughs> and the other's fictional, um, but in terms of their impact, the sort of things they were describing and how that might affect readers, there were similar issues at stake. And it was unthinkable at the time, apparently, that, well, there was an, an immorality trial in, um, pa in Paris for Madame Bovary, but then the French were, did publish it in 1858, uh, or 1857. But um, it was unthinkable that it be published in England. It was so far beyond the bounds of anything in contemporary fiction. Um, and it wasn't published for nearly 30 years. It wasn't translated into English and published in England for nearly 30 years. So, so in, a, in a way, when you think about it, it's fascinating that the newspapers of Observer Apart would print <laughs> a factual version, but mm. publishers would not print the same fictional version. Yeah, it's, uh, it's oh. extraordinary. Yeah. It's one of many sort nice. of ironies of, of, the, of the case and the way that, yes, through the divorce courts, all this material was getting out there and, uh, and in a way, sexual behavior um, and domestic violence, all these things, that was where they, they were being aired and discussed in the pages of paper through the divorce courts. Great. Well, I think perhaps um, we should ask you to air your um, thoughts on divorce <laughs> and um, sexual behavior. Um, <laughs> Sure. I'm sure we're going to have a plethora of questions after that session. We have some roving mics, and um, if you could um, wait for them to arrive in front of you before speaking, um, you can put your questions to Kate and Judith. Um, right, I think we have a lady in the middle of the audience here, and if anyone else has got one, we could have a microphone over there. Over Thank, there. You. Thank you very much. For this, I enjoyed this book uh, very, very much as I did your last book, oh, and I'm you. talking about a historian who does almost exactly the same as you do, but mm -hmm. as a historian. Mm -hmm. So I was very impressed. I think the story, as you explained in the book, was actually more complicated, in the sense that we haven't got the diary, and we have only excerpts selected by the court and then printed by the newspapers. So. Maybe we are unfair to Isabella because we've just got the juicy bit. So mm. on the whole, we've just got the juicy bit. Yeah. So uh, this election, I think, is crucial. And I think you had another important source to bolster your case, which was a lot of letters. Now, Victorians wrote a lot of letters, and this very highly educated woman who moved in these very intellectual circles had a whole stash of letters which she wrote and then she received, and you have seen many of those, haven't you? Uh, so that's, that's I think, uh, the important thing. But I uh, am writing a history of sexuality, and of course I was very drawn mm -hmm. to this idea of diary of a Victorian woman. I mean, we know of many other cases that the Victorian era was not of res repressed sexuality, mm. but actually, uh, in, if you look carefully, of very explicit. Uh, and sexuality and expressions of and here you have a, such a rare source of a woman even <coughs> if it's not true she is expressing her sexual desires mm. in, a, in a very very interesting fashion yeah. and and I think we should celebrate you know that not just see it through the divorce and another thing she was counseled to say that she was insane this was not originally her idea so I think that's quite important yeah that was her way possibly to get off the hook, and in a way she did, didn't she? Yeah. yeah. Um, to go to the, first of all, the thing about the partiality of the di the fact that the diary is so fragmentary and the extracts were all used in court, it, it, it is true that that means that a lot of them are the more, they're not the banal bits about housekeeping and uh, they're more sensational. But I took some, I mean, our source is always going to be incomplete and fragmentary. I took some comfort from the fact that the diary extracts used in court were used both for the prosecution, and so, as it were, so Henry's.
the extracts he made use of, also the extracts she used to defend herself, as it were, by suggesting she was unstable. But also, two years afterwards, the judges published a whole lot more extracts in a legal digest, and I believe that the purpose of, that, of those ones were to give a more three-dimensional picture of her to, com to substantiate their view that she wasn't insane. So at least they're coming from different angles. So although they're incomplete and partial, they are being, they're not all cu coming from one um, with, with an end in mind. Um, and I, I do think, I agree, I think it's an incredibly, struck me as a very rare and fascinating thing to have a woman writing about her sexual desires in that way at that time, whether or not, um, and it, the, whether or not they were fulfilled or fantasized. And the weird thing is that we probably, there were probably other women writing like this, but it's only because her hostile husband <laughs> stole her diary and published it in effect against her will and made his use of it, that we have her story at all. And yet now her story overpowers his. So it's a, it's a very kind of interesting and ironic um, sense of, of why we've got this and the, and the degree to which so it could be celebrated, but there is also a degree of intrusion. This is a purloined <laughs> document. You know, this is a, a source that we were never meant to have. Um, so, y y and, and I, I think that probably fed in a bit to make me cutting her some slack, as it were, for the tone of the diary and so on, along with my memories of the diary I kept as a teenager, that I think we do sh often show ourselves at our worst in diaries, <laughs> most self-obsessed and self-indulgent, and that some allowance should be made for that, and some sense that as a person in the world, she was probably less um, ne needy and, and dramatic mm. as a, than she appears there. Question over there. Um, Hands up for the next one. Yes. That was very Holly. interesting. Thank you very much. I've got two questions. One is, um, <laughs> was there any degree of um, sympathy or fellow feeling for her during the trial, evidenced anywhere? And the other one is, were there any other women putting their heads above the parapet of the status quo <laughs> at the time? Because I can't remember when the suffragette movement was, for instance. Um, well, the, the whether there was any fellow feeling expressed um, that there's evidence of, no. Everyone was appalled that went into print, whether it was by the fact that she was a, an adulteress or that she had written about it. Um, so from every angle, she, she was disgraced. Um, but, you know, as I say, I suspect that there, there may have been some fellow feeling out there and that that may have been one of the effects of the diary being published in this fragmentary form. Um, and there, were, there was a sort of nascent feminist movement at that time. It looked well before the suffragettes, um, but there was, for example, a woman called Caroline Norton who had campaigned um, fiercely for the Custody of Infants Act of 1839, and a lot of, so there were several women who were involved in the r reforms that led to the Divorce Act, although and, but in some ways the position of women wasn't very much improved by the Divorce Act. So there was some of that going on, but these women were very careful to dissociate themselves from any sense of wanting more sexual license or anything like that. No, no, it was all just about women's right to earn um, to earn money, you keep their own property, get rid of husbands who are violent towards them, that kind of thing, morally worthy things, and to have custody of their children. So they wouldn't have publicly identified with Isabella Robinson for a moment. In the front. Are there any uh, direct or collateral descendants of either Isabella or Henry? And if there are, have you had contact with them? I'm aware that you give family trees in, in, in the book. Yeah, the family trees actually are cut off at the point of, the, of 1858. I wanted to represent the family as it was at that moment rather than, as it were, give away <laughs> the ending of the story by what happened afterwards. Um, I haven't been able to trace any descendants of Isabella. Her, the two sons that I can trace of hers, neither of them had children. Um, 
And I did try quite hard just in case there was a transcript of the diary. You know, I thought that it would be more likely to have passed down through her line than, than Henry's. Um, I, I have found one descendant of Henry through a subsequent marriage. And, um, and so, uh, yes, I've been in touch with him. Uh, and he lives in the south of England. And he sent me, he scanned in and emailed me a picture of a photograph of Henry, which was amazing to see. Hmm. Was he aware of his ancestor um, before? Not really, no. Right. Yeah, just his name. <laughs> um, anyone else after that? Um, hands up. Yes, we have a lady on the left there, Holly. Please, no, go ahead, go ahead, oh, and then okay. we'll Sorry. get the microphone Sorry. to the next person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really enjoyed your book. Um, I have you. to confess, I finished it in bed this morning, which was very <laughs> luxurious. <laughs> um, totally on Team Isabella. All the way. <laughs> 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 um, what struck me when I was reading it um, was the number of literary texts that you reference, um, sort of that echo many of the themes that come up um, in your discussion of the diary. So. I think you draw attention to Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfelt Hall, which has a woman whose husband steals her diary. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed your bibliography also cited Mary Braddon's um, The Doctor's Wife, which mm -hmm. is a, a reworking uh, of Madame Bovary. And I couldn't help but think of um, Browning's My Last Duchess, where mm -hmm. you know, we don't have any unmediated access to the woman in the poem. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could maybe just speak a little bit to the literary intertexts that you reference in your book, because I found that connection very fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I guess when I um, c came across the story in the first place, the scene in which um, Henry st steals Isabella's diary while she's lying in her fever, muttering the names of other men, seemed <laughs> to be so kind of uh, powerful and, uh, and, and primitive almost. It sort of felt like something from a fable or, or a novel. And it was, in a way, that scene that really kind of hooked me and felt there was something about his invasion of her privacy uh, and something very dangerous at that moment. And, but, and, um, and the fact that her dream world was sort of speaking through her and whether she wanted the diary found. And I think often when there's a story I really want to find out about and, and tell and research, um, it, it is because I recognize something almost novelistic, like some memory, a novelistic memory in it. And so in a funny way, I wasn't that surprised when I started reading around the period to, to find that in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which I'd never previously read, there was just such a scene, and um, which th this predated the, the story. Um, the actual story and then but I did I did recognize me oh yes in the woman in white Count Fosco steals Marion Hol Holcomb's diary as she lies in a fever and I thought this must be drawn it's two years after the Robinson trial and um, and I had read that book so I think there was a, an echo in my mind and um, and I don't um, th the question of whether there were any simp to go back to that question of whether there were sympathetic listeners at the time to the diary. Um, those were novelists, perhaps, so that in East Lynn um, or in The Doctor's Wife, there are women that are treated as, you know, they're bad, they're immoral, there's no sense of the novelist approving of them, but there is a sense of the novelist in the meantime kind of living them, you know, and making them live for a reader. And so there is an act of imaginative sympathy there um, that I, I can sort of trace back. And I, I'm, n I'm not so, as with the Madame Bovary thing, where it was happening at the same, it was being written at the same time as the diary, um, it's not so, it's not only about what effect did the real case have on literature, you know, how did people pick out, how did it change, because sometimes it can be something that happens before, like the Anne Bronte novel, a novel that's written before, that just picks something out about the atmosphere of the times and the anxieties of the times and, um, and that still are anxieties of now because I can respond to them and recognize them. So there, there's something about that. That's how I think about the way that the novels and the real life stories and the newspaper stories interact. It's a two-way traffic. Isabella Robinson may well have read Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. <laughs> 
have a lady there, and does, do we have another questioner after that? Uh, yes, over to the left, thank you. So if there's a person, Holly, just a person here, have a microphone. Sorry, I thought there was someone in there. Just a quick question. So um, did Isabella want to win her case just because of the children or were there other things around um, being a disgrace or in that way yeah. as well? Yeah, that's, um, that's an important thing and it really puzzled me for a long while uh, why she wanted to win her case because, in fact, Henry had already secured a legal separation from her and... She, so he had the children, they were, they were his in any case, she had no access to them. Um, and the case obviously brought much more, the divorce case um, was a really public humiliation for her and ruined her reputation forever. Um, and the, the money, it's not clear, but I think it, pretty obviously she would retain some of her settlement in any event, it wasn't Henry's money. So she, what did she have to gain? Um, but I did uh, decide through reading these letters um, in a Scottish archive that what seemed to have happened was that she, the, her, the friends of Dr. Lane had put pressure on her to save him, um, to deny adultery with him in court in London because if he'd been found uh, guilty of adultery, um, it, th there was no legal punishment but his um, career would have been destroyed because he was a physician and he was entrusted with the care of women so uh, and I think that Isabella it wasn't just a question of having pressure put on her from without I think she put the pressure on her from within too because um, he, he had been kind to her um, she loved him and his mother-in-law and wife had also been extraordinarily kind and generous to her and I think this is another example of her own, by her own private morality, Henry deserved nothing, um, and she quite enjoys spiting him by, not, by um, resisting the divorce. But I think she did feel really bad about Edward Lane and the potential disaster that she was bringing on him by having written this diary and being careless with it. That, just in Dr. Lane saved. Was Dr. Lane saved? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and um, Darwin reported um, in the year after the trial, Darwin went to Dr. Lane's new hydrotherapy spa and in Richmond and said not one of his patients had given him up, that um, his reputation survived intact. And, uh, um, mine was just really a comment. I, I teach Victorian, fiction, uh, Victorian literature and I wanted to say I absolutely love The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher and I really recommend it to anybody here who has not read it. I thought the historical detail was brilliant and it's a wonderful book to have at the same time as teaching things like Lady Orderly's Secret and um, um, The Woman in White and I thought it was absolutely Great. brilliant. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes, a lady here. Yeah, I was just wondering whether you found any connections between Isabella and her situation with um, about a hundred years later and Betty Friedan's The Problem That Has No Name because it seems to me that Isabella was bored out of her skull mm. which <laughs> is what was Betty Friedan's problem as well to yes. some extent. Yeah. Yes, I think, I think that's right. Uh, she was... Um, and, and I think that was something that Flaubert was tapping into in Madame Bovary also, an intense kind of restlessness and ennui, a lack of stuff to engage with and do. She was incredibly intellectually restless but, and dissatisfied and ambitious, actually. Um, and she, she'd keep writing to Mr. Coombe, the phrenologist, saying, do you think I should write this piece about, um, send this piece about my... Where we are, we've gone God to a magazine, and he would discourage her. <laughs> um, so, but but socially also, she was she was bored, bored, and um, and I think that there was a recognition of of this as a problem um, that women's sexual and social and intellectual dissatisfaction. If you read enough in that period, the 1850s, you realise that lots of doctors were very worried about it that there was a lot of anxiety about what was going on 
in, and diaries were the obvious repository of this kind of restlessness and ennui, which is one of the reasons they became such potent symbols of a woman's kind of uh, boredom and the kind of secretiveness and potential subversion that it might breed. Um, Kate, Kate, may I ask you a question? Um, I'm fascinated as a, a social historian as well in where you're coming from as a writer. Do you start um, with your historian hat on trying to recreate a time or do you go out looking for a fantastic story mm. um, which in a way seems to have been the case with Mrs. Robinson is that you happened upon it yeah. and thought... My gosh, that's, a, that's a, a real melodrama if ever I saw one. Yeah. Are you a, 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 a dramatist or are you an historian first and foremost? Um, I, d I don't really think of myself as a historian. I'm not trained as one. Um, I, it's just the story that gets me the, the, the storytelling. And then I research the history um, only in so far, but it's quite a lot that you need to do only, um, as, it, as to understand the story mm. and illuminate it. So I'll just go to the bits, you know, I need, I need to know about diary writing. I need to know the history of diary writing. I need to know about um, atheism in the 1850s. I mean, there's quite a lot of bits, so eventually it all adds up to something like a little miniature mm. um, of the time, I hope. But... Um, but there's no sense in which I'm trying to generally educate myself or to paint a portrait of an era. I'm just trying to get at this one story and make it as, as vivid and as comprehensible as I can. I think that's what's so wonderful about both the books, is that you have managed to um, keep the narrative so that you really want to read what's going to happen next and at the same time to interpolate all this fascinating historical detail. Um, do we have time for one last question, Diana? I just wondered whether you thought that you are, um, uh, as a creative artist, attracted to irresolution, um, because both, mm. from the, both books um, really, uh, it, they leave a lot of questions and there's no absolute uh, you know, a coup where, you, where it, it all unravels and then you understand it, you know, you, you can uh, put all the pieces of the jigsaw together. And I just wonder, would you ever be attracted to write something where there's, you know, you, 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 all the answers and all your curiosity is satisfied at the end? Um, no, I, I, <laughs> I don't think I would. I think you're right. Is there I, such a thing? Is the, people can detective Yeah. No, and I think um, that is what's sort of attractive about non-fiction to me is that there always will be that element of irresolution, um, but it doesn't stop me wanting to resolve it, and that's the, <laughs> that's the tension, you know, that, that there's a kind of allure to uncertainty and a sort of power to it, but you also want to try to overcome it. And I, I'm, when I start on a... A story um, I'm researching. I don't know what the sources will be. I don't know how it'll end. I don't know what's going to happen. And that's really important to me as a researcher that I don't know because um, that's what keeps me interested <laughs> and, and excited. Uh, and it does. And so I will end up somewhere, but there will also always be questions, and, um, and I, I like that. <laughs> Well, I think perhaps that's a very good place to end. I think we'd all love to know what happens in the end, but at the same time, the narrative is keeping us going. I think a very strong message to me has come through this, or rather a dual message. One is that as an historian, um, I hope that anyone in this audience who is currently writing a diary um, will hang on to it. Oh, I thought you were going to say burn on, it. On the other hand, <laughs> I'll beat you to it. I'm going straight home to burn mine. <laughs> Um, I think that was a, a really fascinating session. Thank you very much for your wonderful historical insights.